So startups obviously put a ton of work into building their products. Most of the time, those products are powered by data. And one, I mean, there's actually a bunch of things that can screw you over, but one for sure is a lapse in cybersecurity. So our next panelists are going to talk about what's out there coming at you and the best ways to avoid that lapse. Please welcome to the stage from Google, Maddie Stone, and from the ACLU, Jennifer Granick, as well as your moderator, Zach Whitaker. Warm welcome, please. <laughs> It's so nice to be back after two years away. Thank you so much for joining us, Maddie and Jennifer. Thanks. Every startup in this audience and watching live has something in common, and that's surveillance. Some of you are actively defending against it, and some of you are blissfully unaware that you're sleepwalking your startups into becoming extensions of the next surveillance state. So this talk might scare the shit out of some of you. I apologize in advance. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Jennifer, I'd love to start with you. Um, as the ACLU's Cybersecurity and Surveillance Council, you closely follow the public sentiment with regards to privacy. Uh, looking around us, we have uh, our devices are encrypted, some of our messages are encrypted. How did we get here? Why has there been such an intense um, trend towards privacy in recent years, and especially the last few months? Yeah, I, I mean, privacy has always been really important. Um, for a variety of reasons stemming from either protecting yourself from uh, identity thieves or hackers to um, protecting yourself from uh, overzealous law enforcement um, here in this country and in other countries. But I think more and more people are realizing how important privacy is in the post Roe v. Wade world. Um, now that the Dobbs decision came down, I think people are realizing that the data that we produce can be used by law enforcement in some of the abortion ban states to go after and to prosecute people for exercising their uh, right to get an abortion. And so people are really sensitive now, like all this data is out there about me. Um, and it's nice for those of us who have been working on privacy for a long time because it feels like people finally appreciate us. Um, so it's unfortunate this has to be it, but it's really great that um, the public is becoming sensitized to the problem of having our data just out there. We have so many examples of that coming along the way as well. <laughs> um, Maddie, welcome. You're a security researcher at Google's Project Zero, a team where you've investigated how security bugs are exploited by spyware and other bad actors. Um, for the budding CISOs watching uh, and in the audience today, um, how much does cybersecurity factor into defending against surveillance? So it's everything when it comes to defending against surveillance, because if they can't access your data, they can't get gain access to the camera, the microphone, um, all of the different parts that could be used to surveil, then you can't really do surveillance at this easy across the world, across the city, not being in physical proximity. So security can address all of those concerns. And on Project Zero, our goal is make zero day hard. And so that doesn't say make zero day exploits, which are the exploits that are targeting the vulnerabilities no one yet knows exists and are generally used by the commercial surveillance companies or state sponsored actors. We're not saying make zero day non-existent. We're saying make zero day hard, meaning that it's so costly, so requires so much expertise, requires such a time investment from these folks who want to do surveillance, that it's really not worth it to go after you know, folks' phones or after companies storing data or things like that. And so that's really what it is, is changing this balance of the return on investment. And right now, it's just too easy. Hmm. Uh, yeah, can I just can yeah. I just add to that? I think to add to what Maggie's saying, you know, our legal regime is not that protective. It actually makes it quite easy for uh, law enforcement and for foreign intelligence agencies, never mind from other countries other than the U.S., to get this data. So really, security and technology are the first and best step towards protecting our privacy. So is defending against powerful adversaries like governments an impossible task? Is is there hope? Yes, I would not be waking up and doing my job every day if I did not think we could make a difference. There are a lot of practical 
and tangible actions we can take that will actually make it really, really difficult for folks to be able to say, hey, I want to scan all these people's phones and see who's in this location at this time. Um, let's check who's sending WhatsApp messages or signal messages you know, to each other. By raising basic levels of security, things like, you know, are people applying patches? Uh, is two-factor authentication, which means you don't just put in one password that someone actually has another token or piece of information that's added to it. All of these basic sort of security hygiene things that we've been talking about for decades directly makes it harder for these nation state and very sophisticated adversaries. Because the thing is, is when I study zero days, the most sophisticated type of security attack someone could use. And it's interesting right now because those are being used in these highly impactful societal ways of targeting politicians and journalists and human rights defenders. But as long as other people are able to use less sophisticated means, that's why we're not talking about these zero days as a being used by crimeware groups or, you know, a dime a dozen, because they can use easier things. So by continuing to raise that bar, yeah, we can make a big difference and make their lives really, really hard. So there is hope. Yes. That's good to know. <laughs> and so I really want to focus on, for a second, why we're talking about this today and the harms that surveillance has on, on people. Uh, Jennifer, uh, why should every company here be thinking about surveillance and what are the consequences if they don't? I mean, I think um, there's a feeling that, well, if I'm not doing anything wrong, then I don't have anything to worry about. And then the corresponding feeling, well, you know, then my, this data that I collect isn't dangerous to my users. Um, and that's just not true uh, anymore if it ever was. We mentioned the abortion example, but, um, you know, first of all, a ton of things are illegal that you don't even realize are illegal. So it makes it possible to put people at risk or in the fear of risk to, um, you know, just based on what the information is that out, that's out there. Um, and then the other, you know, saying is if you give me six lines written in the hand of an innocent man, I'll find enough to hang him. Um, and that is totally true. And just like a very quick story, um, I had a friend who had a client, his client witnessed a murder. But the police didn't believe he was a witness. They thought that he was a member of the gang involved in the murder. And so they got 10 years of his Facebook history, all his photos, and basically just cherry picked out of the thousands and thousands of photos, the ones where he was wearing red. And then said, okay, this means that he was in the gang. And so, you know, even the most innocent of information in the wrong hands can be misused. So let's take a look, um, a closer look at some of the headlines uh, we've seen recently. Uh, these are just a few big examples of surveillance you might have seen in the past few years. And let's stick with spyware, or surveillance by zero day, where security flaws are exploited to spy on people. So let's start there. Um, Maddie, as you said, you know, part of your job is, is trying to make it harder for bad actors to exploit zero days. Um, you did mention a little earlier, but could you just give us a little example of um, what is a zero day and why do we call them that? So a zero day is a bug, a mistake, a vulnerability in the code base that defenders don't yet know exists. We don't know about that specific one. So an in-day vulnerability, the opposite of a zero day, is one where it's been reported to the vendor or someone found it, and you know there's a patch you can go and download. There's antivirus signatures to be able to find when someone's trying to exploit it. The zero days are the ones that we all know there's mistakes in code. I hope that's not groundbreaking. But they're the ones that a adversary or an attacker has found, but defenders and the security teams don't yet know. And so as teams working on the zero day area, we're trying to find things that we don't know what they look like. And that's really why they're so powerful, is because you can't have these, you know, running your antivirus signatures or things like that to protect yourself. And the zero day term comes from there has been zero days since it's been known. So governments are known for, you know, among many things, but the, the excessive use of surveillance. Um, what are the risks and consequences of governments using undisclosed zero days? Yeah, so, one, they're huge, but to break it down, you know, even bigger than that is most organizations 
or individuals today probably do not need to worry about being individually targeted with zero-day exploits. However, they impact each and every one of us when our politicians and political systems are being hacked with these zero days, when our critical infrastructure, when minoritized populations are being mass exploited with this to monitor their movements, journalists, human rights defenders, that impacts us all at this very large societal level. And so we need to all care about these things, not just be like, oh yeah, there was a zero day in blah, 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 phone operating system. Um, but we don't really need to pay that much attention because it was only used against this one group. No, like we all need to care when the most vulnerable among us are being targeted. And from selfishly, it affects us all. Does it, from a legal point of view, also set a, a bad precedent if governments are using zero days? It's almost like one rule for them, one rule for us, which I know applies to governments a lot of the time, but should it apply for them? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not even so much a fairness thing, but it's a question of what do we want our government to be incentivized to do? And really, the government should be incentivized to try to protect us from attackers, protect us from hackers. But when the government, when governments use zero days, they have a investment in our communications technology remaining insecure. And so instead of having a defender mentality, they have an offender mentality. And that results in insufficient um, investment, insufficient efforts to try to help people secure themselves. And if a government can get in, then other actors can get in as well. So it's really dangerous just to have the government not on your side. And to, to add on to that, as um, Jennifer was saying, where it's leaving this hole, these vulnerabilities and zero-day exploits are not a tangible thing that only one person can have and no one else can have it if they have it. And what we see as a team who also tries to mimic the behaviors of attackers and finding these zero-day vulnerabilities and reporting them publicly is that there's a huge amount of bug collisions, meaning we're finding the same bugs as other security researchers, as also the offensive surveillance um, uh, vendors and people who sell exploits. Uh, so how do we make it more difficult for surveillance actors like nation states to exploit zero days? Well, so one is when a vulnerability is uh, reported to you, patch it as quickly as possible, but also use that information to figure out where all the other holes are in your system. So talking to some of the folks who work in the offensive exploit market currently, and just from the data I'm collecting of all of the zero days being actively exploited in the wild, is that attackers are having success right now by using variants of zero day vulnerabilities that are already public known. So basically, someone reports the vulnerability at, in the code base, they provide a proof of concept. Well, that same pattern exists elsewhere in the code base, yet the vendor only fixed that one place. And so all the attacker has to do is plug and play, find that exact same pattern somewhere else. And that's what people are doing right now, is in the first half of t this year, 2022, more than 50% of the in the wild zero days, so the ones that were being actively exploited, were variants of things we've seen in the last two or three years. Yeah. And how much does communication and transparency play into that? You're very vocal about these things. You have a public spreadsheet documenting what is known about the zero days so far this year and, and by year. Um, but how much does communication and being public and transparent and explaining these things to the, to the public and blog posts and publications and so on help? It's it's one of the biggest things I need, I think we need to be focused on and one of the reasons why I'm optimistic. So for the last three years, you know, really pushing on the fact that, hey, if you're a vendor, whenever you're issuing a security bulletin and patch, if you have reason to believe that it's being actively exploited in the wild, disclose that to everyone, that it's not just another vulnerability. And the reason behind that is one, for targeted populations, even if there might not be evidence they specifically were targeted, you're giving them a piece of information to take their own autonomy and make their own choices of, okay, I know these types of actors have targeted me in the past, they may now, I need to assume everything that happened on that app or that device um, was compromised. And that can provide more physical safety. But as an industry perspective, it means we can all learn from each other, we can figure out 
what the chains look like. Because today, a zero-day capability almost always has two or three exploits chained together. And so that often means you're talking through different products. You know, it might start on Chrome and then go to Windows. Um, it might go um, messaging app to um, a app, another app on the phone to finally an Android privilege escalation. So these capabilities are collaborative, then that means we need to all be working together. 2021 was the most zero days we'd ever seen in the wild. Um, and I think that's actually because of the transparency in the industry. Both Android and Apple began um, publishing this information when they knew of active exploitation happening. And that just gave us so much more view into what are these attackers actually doing so that we can have this ground truth when as defenders, you know, it helps us be able to make those choices of where do we invest? What's actually going to make it harder for them? Yeah. I want to talk about another kind of pervasive tracking, one that might uh, hit a little close to home with some of the folks in the audience. Um, data brokers, the companies that collect and buy the granular location data from smartphone apps from billions of devices around the world and then sell it to governments and militaries. So why would governments want that data? What's so valuable about location data from smartphone apps? I mean, location data is extremely sensitive. Whether you are looking for it in mass as like kind of a bulk collection and you want to see where populations are moving, um, that was something that the government, governments were interested in in the early days of COVID where there were um, quarantines or uh, yeah, uh, shelter in place type orders. It's like, are people leaving Brooklyn and coming to Manhattan, for example? Are people crossing the border and going to abortion clinics? In aggregate, who was at the bank robbery? Who was at the Black Lives Matter protest? Who was at January 6th? So this information in bulk is extremely, um, is extremely revealing. Um, and it also, you know, location history allows you to track an individual or individuals. They went to the, um, you know, AA meeting, they went to the mosque, they went to their parents' house, they went, you know, that sort of thing. So the information is very revealing. And one of the great things about buying it from a data broker is you don't have to go get a warrant from a court. So there's no a point where the law enforcement agent has to prove that the need for the information exists. It's really just what they want. And so there is an assumption that if you've got nothing to hide or if you think you've done nothing wrong, that there's no fear from the government. But we've also seen that's not necessarily the case on several, you know, many cases. And we've also seen the US government buying bulk location data from yeah. data brokers. So how much of a threat are data brokers? I think data brokers are a big threat um, because it is a way of circumventing the even modest legal protections that we have for this data. Um, and it's really not transparent. We don't know how much data law enforcement gets from data brokers. We don't know how they're using that data. We don't know what they're, you know, how they keep it. Um, and you know, sometimes we never know because there's no criminal charges. They're following people who are you know, innocent for some reason. Or even when there are some charges, there's this thing called parallel construction where law enforcement can go and pretend that they found the information through a legitimate path even though they found it through a different way that they want to keep secret. There's all kinds of doctrines that law enforcement uses in order to keep secret what they're actually doing in terms of surveillance. So a lot of um, startups you know, use SDKs and they use you know, all kinds of plugins and code to extract location data and give that to data brokers. It's part of, you know, it's a way to make money. Um, and a lot of data brokers offer money to developers uh, for location data. But it's not us doing the surveillance, they might say. So who's, who's responsible um, ultimately for um, apps and services that give data to data brokers? Who's responsible for that? The app developer. Any of us who are writing software and then delivering it to customers are responsible for whatever um, code we're giving to our co customers. And that means looking at libraries, looking at the SDKs, all of those different pieces, if you're putting it out there, then your users can be harmed. And that's on each of us to really evaluate what are we um, handing over to them. And that comes both with the data collection along with um, you know, vulnerabilities too. Are you making your users more vulnerable by using this library and not taking updates and things like that? An example is back prior to Project Zero, I worked on the Android malware team and we discovered this giant botnet that was on millions of devices around the world and 
it got on all of those devices because they had sold themselves as, as a monetization SDK to all these app developers. But it did lots of different types of things to monetize itself, such as, not as common here in the US, but premium SMS fraud, where it would send a bunch, it would register a premium number, send a bunch of these text messages, and then that money comes from the user's bill. Um, so things like that of, yeah, the de app developers were like, no, it's just a monetization SDK, but it's actively stealing money from each of your users. So historically, data is money, and selling access to users' location data or any other data is how a lot of startups make money. So how much surveillance, or rather, how much surveillance or um, as, uh, as a whole or even on a, you know, on a granular level can be fixed by new business models? I, I think the business model is a really important piece of the vulnerability. Like, if you don't know how you're going to make money, that's a problem. Um, because eventually, you know, investors or if you go public and sell shares, there's going to be some point at which somebody's like, okay, what do you have to make money off of? And if all you have is the user data, there's going to be a huge pressure to do that. Um, I think that, you know, the question is how, what kind of advertising model or other model can you do without collecting so much um, personally identifiable information that can be traced back to a real person. So I think there's some technological approaches which could be like anonymization or pseudonymization or, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, technologies where you can do data analysis without having the information be aggregated or be identified. Um, and I think that's really important. Obviously, you could have a pay subscription model that works for some things, doesn't work for everything. And, you know, I don't think everybody should necessarily have to pay, but we really need to think very carefully about how we collect and analyze the data, lest you end up being part of this, you know, surveillance, capitalism, um, you know, pollution of data that's out there. So let's stay with that um, for a moment. You know, let's try and end on a, on a, on a positive note. Um, let's say that your business relies on user data, unavoidably, a lot of companies do. How do you defend that data? What are some of the things that startups can do to prevent their users' data from ending up in the hands of hackers and governments? I, Maddie, you touched on this a little bit at the start. Yeah, so really evaluating your security hygiene. So there's a lot of documents out there nowadays, like even CISA for the US government publishes a lot of these guidelines of things of, you know, even at the beginning, evaluating your password situation, like is the same password used elsewhere? If you're buying software and products from some people, um, are you changing that? So until you get those, I would say you don't need to quite worry fully about the zero day problem, um, because by forcing people to use zero days, that's that is better than them being able to use cheaper techniques. Um, but also, one of the ways that I don't think a lot of people think about that they can make an impact is a lot of companies and startups are buying software or products or laptops, computers, from other big companies to use. And so there actually is power in that of trying to get these changes in the industry that we're looking for of how often are you going to provide me security bulletins do you, you promise that if you know of something being exploited, that you will tell me about it? Uh, what type of analyses do you do when they're report, reported to you? And that's where I think a lot, it's very easy to get into that individual mindset of, oh, I'm just one person, I'm just one company. But when you're paying people to do stuff, it suddenly becomes much more powerful to start asking and um, sort of demanding some of these answers. And when lots and lots of, you know, individual companies start doing this, then that becomes this wave of, oh, we need to start doing this if we want to keep making money and selling our products to folks. Yeah. yeah. There are an increasing number of privacy-protecting technologies that are out there. Like, I'm on the board of Let's Encrypt, the certificate authority, and one of our projects as part of the Internet Security Research Group is a product Divvy Up, which is designed to try to do analysis on data um, without it all being, like, aggregated and identified. So you need to think about and look for that and kind of build security and privacy in from the very beginning instead of thinking about it as a as an aftermath. And I would just say the same thing about law. If you have data, people are going to try to come and get it, and you need to have a robust process in place for when those uh, government demands come in. We only have a few minutes left. Um, what more can we do on an individual level, especially here in the US? I know there are some laws in, in Congress. 
aiming to tackle some of the, the data broker issues, but what more can we do? Yeah, from a legal perspective, um, you know, call your congressperson, um, both at the federal level, uh, there's a bill called the um, Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act that would deal with data brokers. There's a couple of um, transparency bills out there about data requests, and especially at the state level, we're seeing real progress in terms of legislation, especially here in California, but also in New York. And there's just a real um, like enthusiasm for states passing more privacy laws uh, because of Dobbs. Yeah, Amanda, what would you say? Uh, what, can, what more can we do on an individual level um, here in the US? Uh, well, I don't know all the legal. So from, me, from my perspective on the technical is individual level protect yourself of apply patches as soon as they're available. A lot of systems now have auto update because that really is what protects you from the mass exploitation. Because as soon as those vulnerabilities are out there in a patch, there are thousands of people around the world doing what's called patch diffing to figure out what's the vulnerability and how do I exploit it? Because that's much easier than the zero days. And so while you might not be a target of the state-sponsored actors, the non-state-sponsored actors that there's a whole lot more of um, are looking to get anyone they can. So applying the updates, um, is probably the biggest way to protect yourself. And uh, surveillance, you know, isn't just a is a, just a U.S. thing. Um, I also just want to kind of um, end on a bit of a brighter note. We've got about a minute left on the clock. Um, in terms of startups that are doing things, you mentioned Let's Encrypt is a nonprofit that uh, um, gives out free uh, TLS certificates. Um, are there any other startups that you can think of that, that are doing some really good things at the moment that you can? They can share with the audience. Less Encrypt is a good one, to be fair. Yeah, I mean, I'm on the board, so I'm familiar with uh, ISRG's products. We also have a project, um, Prosimo, which is about trying to take code libraries and put them in a more secure programming language. Um, so I just, you know, I, I'm on the board, and it's a really awesome uh, organization. We're doing some really cutting edge things. Yeah. Uh, Sorry to put you on the spot in the last second. I'm so sorry. Uh, we hope everybody, everybody in the audience are the ones who are going to be doing really awesome things after having listened to this panel. That's the, yes. that's the real hope. And uh, I hope you folks uh, weren't, weren't scared too much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again. Maddie thank Stone. you for having me. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.